announcement. Did you know that from September 15th to October 15th is Hispanic Heritage Month? And to honor this, TechSoup is hosting a special in-person event. Guys, we haven't been in person in a long time, but it's going to be in the local Bay Area. So if you're in the Bay Area, um, we would love for you to attend. Um, it's going to be October 15th from 6 p.m. to 8 p.m. at our San Francisco office, our TechSoup San Francisco office. It's going to be networking, talks. And guess, guess what? Free food. The food is going to be by El Pipila. I hope I'm saying that's right. I'm probably messing it up. But everything Hispanic, the food, every, the music, everything. So mark your calendars. We can't wait to see you. I'll be putting the link in the chat so you can register for that in just a moment. So now I'm getting ready to turn it over to the person you've been looking for, Melanie Myers. Melanie, you can go ahead and start sharing your screen and um, she'll introduce herself in just a moment. I appreciate you all being here and I'll see you at the end. Have a great webinar, Melanie. All right, great. Give me a minute to share my screen. We thought this would be smooth, but I'm not as smooth today. So, um, all right, let's see. Can everyone see my screen? Can yes, we can, looking can good. It? All right. Well, thank you all for joining today. A um, little bit about myself. Um, I am Chief Customer Officer for Tech Impact. Tech Impact is a nonprofit serving nonprofits in the tech space. We've been a longtime partner with TechSoup. So we both have incredible missions to help nonprofits evolve their technology. Um, prior to my role at Tech Impact, I was like many of you. I spent 20 years inside a serving a nonprofit. Um, I, you know, started started at a very young age. Um, was the most tech savvy and became what you call an accidental techie, uh, serving the organization's tech needs. Um, and then, you know, a, as I grew with the organization. So it became tech, marketing, communications, data management, event management, sponsorship. So I know how nonprofits kind of work um, and that many of you have more than just one role, maybe outside of technology. Maybe some of you um, don't. Maybe your only focus is technology. Um, technology has evolved incredibly, but just want to thank you for being here today and taking the time to um, just kind of learn how to assess your tech and, and put a technology plan in place. Um, I can tell you that if I could have taken this advice I'm going to give today and done it at my previous organization, things probably would have went a lot smoother for me in terms of the organization. But what did I know? I was a young one just trying to survive in the organization. So I'm glad to be with you today and share the advice with you. Um, so at Tech Impact, um, we, we you know, deliver on our mission in several ways. So starting on the left, we offer a full suite of nonprofit technology services um, from everything from managed IT support to cloud services to data support. Uh, we currently have over 360 managed support um, managed IT support clients that we serve on a regular basis. Um, you know, we create independent, thoroughly researched technology resources like this webinar. Our main goal is to educate the nonprofit sector. We do a lot of publications to help the social sector. Um, um, an example might be uh, looking at the most common donor management systems and breaking them down by cost, um, features and, and criteria. So really doing that homework for nonprofits to make it a little bit easier when choosing software solutions. And then we also help young adults launch their careers by offering free IT and customer experience trainings. Um, and so all of these services are designed and delivered to help nonprofits and communities thrive. Um, really great point is we and our IT works candidates, that's where we give our young adults um, training and to, to serve organizations with IT experience. And we're about to graduate our thousand, um, thousand candidates. So really exciting and great work to see what that, that side of the house is doing. So 
So like you, we have our fees for services that we deliver right to nonprofits at, you know, at nonprofit pricing, but we also have a lot of arms and I think nonprofits can appreciate that where our programs are so we can relate with a lot of nonprofits. Um, TechSoup has a lot of great training resources like this webinar and that, but if you're ever looking for another source for nonprofit technology training, we have a learning center as well with over 200 um, trainings in that. That is where you will also find the guide to fundraising systems or guide to donor management, but that's where you can also find our research publications. Um, so today we're going to talk about how to think, assess, act, and budget when it comes to technology. It's an incredible amount to cover. You'll get a copy of this presentation after the workshop. And I also have some worksheets built in here. Um, and we will make sure that we provide you a link to those worksheets. Um, so Aretha will send those out um, to you. Um, and, and, you know, but I just want you to remember as we're going there, you're going to be in a different place. Just remember, this is not all inclusive or specific to your organization. Your needs are going to vary, but the concepts covered today will help you get started. And I hope everyone has something good for lunch. Um, my lunch time will come after this. Uh, <laughs> So technology planning, um, it's like any other plan you do for your organization. It helps you plot out your direction and priorities. Uh, when you think about technology, just don't think about the infrastructure, like your workstations, internet, all that. Think bigger. Uh, how can you tie technology back to your organization goals and how can technology aid and further their goals? Really, when you look at organization, technology touches all within an organization. Um, my advice, uh, most important thing, it, either if you have five staff over a hundred, you need to have open discussions about technology. The best way to start, in my opinion, is having a dedicated tech committee. So you'll want to think of the tech committee as, you know, as roots that work in two ways. So drawing up needs and ideas from the teams they represent and then feeding their teams with training and information on projects and available technology. So suggested committee members should include obviously the staff responsible for technology. Hopefully there is someone responsible for technology, the chief executive, uh, an executive representation of each function, development, marketing, HR, finance, and if it fits someone from each program area. Um, my advice too is don't skip on adding someone from the support staff. In my opinion, this is most likely the person with the most experience in the systems. And most times they can offer up the best solutions. Uh, you know, with politics and all that, you know, sometimes tech gets heated. So, you know, you might want to consider if you need outside counsel. Consultants can be useful to provide expertise if you're not familiar with your options, knowledge of what's worked for others, uh, project management to keep you moving forward, an outside perspective is key if you're likely to get weighed down in politics, extra pair of hands if you already got too much to do. Um, also think about your board. Is there someone who has the expertise and would like to be involved? And then ensure that you're getting feedback from all staff consider sending a survey to capture what is working and, and what is not for the organization. I know if we're going to work with the organization and we're going to do a strategic technology plan, say high level, we're going to want to work with all key stakeholders, anybody who's in charge of a program in those functional areas. But we also do an entire survey to staff to just capture where they're saving documents, like what they're happy with, what where their biggest struggles are. So that feedback is going to be incredibly helpful as you plan for the future. Um, as I said, we have some resources. I'm sure TechSoup has some um, things, but we have a few online survey tools for nonprofits. So this will be in the PowerPoint deck if you're looking for a new survey tool. Um, we're probably mo uh, there's a lot there's a lot of options now. Um, than there was in the past. I think we all used to use SurveyMonkey, but now there's a definitely a breadth of options when it comes to survey tools. My biggest advice is inventory. Once you get that committee going, even if you wanna send a special thing, but just inventory, what it is that you're currently using, what is its function, 
who's the staff responsible for that software, who's using it and the annual cost, and then be track renewal dates and months. Whether you use this spreadsheet, you use a project management tool, whether you use some of off the market tracking tools, asset tracking tools, this you will see um, most times when you start to inventory what staff are using and what solutions you're using, you're gonna see maybe staff not utilizing the nonprofit discounts that are available to nonprofits in terms of licensing. You might see duplicate licensing. Um, and you really should just keep like, you know, if you're paying for box, really putting down what your annual cost is. And as you work towards assessing your technology and a path forward, being able to hopefully bring down those costs. And we'll get into licensing in a little bit later. Uh, most organizations are probably using Microsoft and Google, and I just want to kind of break down the licensing. When we work with nonprofits, the most, the, the biggest thing we see is them not understanding the licensing, overpaying for licensing. So we really want to add some transparency onto what it is that you should be paying for licensing. Um, so as you start this tech committee, you're going to want to identify the key metrics that you as an organization are trying to achieve. Again, you're going to want to reference your strategic plan. I think anytime an organization, if there's a lot of chief executives here, having someone at the table during that strategic planning brings a whole different viewpoint to the organization and how you can leverage technology to expand and grow your mission. Um, so do you want to grow a program or service? Do you want to start serving new geographies? Like what is it as you as an organization? And then how can tech help enable that? There's a lot of talk now about AI and all of that. So do you have the right infrastructure? And then what is the overall arching goal or st strategy that your organization is trying to achieve? So just like a strategic plan that outlines the three key priorities for how you're going to meet your mission over the next three to five years, you would create a strategic technology plan that walks through how you're going to use technology to support those priorities. You might be planning in other areas too. So maybe you'd have a fundraising plan or a marketing plan. The tactics would ideally come after an outline of how you are going to get there and what technologies you're going to implement to achieve your goals. You know, so when thinking strategic, tactical versus strategic, um, kind of putting them in these two buckets. So tactical, what technology could make the biggest difference in your efficiency? What is the plan for this year? Are we fully utilizing what we already have? Do our systems work? Does staff know what you have? Is staff using your systems or creating shadow systems? AKA side Excel sheets, um, Google Sheets, um, so that are not in a centralized system. And then if you have systems, why aren't they using your systems? Have they been properly trained or are there bigger issues with the solutions you have in place? So you're gonna wanna use that tech committee to bring these issues to light. They can also help fuel the adoption. So having important outcomes and processes that only happen if, if your people use the system. Um, I know I struggle, chief executive will want a briefing from our data system, um, you know, just on what we were doing for key funders. And unless individuals were putting the information into the system, I really couldn't report because it had blank or missing information. And then we were just using assumptions on the data that we have. So strategic, you're going to want to think three to five year plan. Um, are we choosing technology that will still exist and fit where we expect it to be in a few years? How can technology best fuel our mission and better deliver our services? And you probably guessed it, strategy, you know, strategic will most likely tie back to that strategic plan and the key metrics that you're trying to achieve. Uh, we have a um, tech impact strategic tech plan template. So that might help get you started with your committee and just um, helping start form the discussions on your strategic technology plan. Um, so now that we've talked about how you identify your goals, you know, putting together a tech committee and how you think about technology, we're gonna talk more about how you assess your current technology. 
So I like to think, you know, you can assess your technology in three major categories. So your infrastructure, that is the base for your organization. This is your hardware, your computers, your printers, your phones, your internet. These are key components of everyday work. Um, so without a working computer, if you're not upgrading your computers on a regular cycle, staff are gonna have a hard time doing their work. Um, productivity and collaboration, this is the efficiency and effectiveness in which your staff can perform their day-to-day -day functions. This includes email, file sharing, and software. We're gonna dive a little bit into this. Are you using multiple? Um, are people choosing what systems they wanna use? Um, and then let's look at controls over there and where you best fit. And then there's the data and strategic systems. How do you manage, track, report, and support your key business functions and stakeholder information? So again, we're gonna cover a lot of different areas which can feel a little bit overwhelming. Remember, as we discuss each of these areas, you need to put as much emphasis on the oversight as well as the actual technology. Um, procedures should be well-defined and user training and support needs to be ongoing. It's not like you just fix one and you let it go. And then at the top of mind in any of these areas, as you can imagine, I'm gonna say should be security. Um, you have an obligation to keep your client and stakeholder information secure, whether that means your infrastructure, your email, and your file sharing, or your data and strategic system. So security should always be top of mind. Uh, poor Annie, hopefully she can get the recording because she had a tech emergency. Yes, we all know how that goes. Um, so here are some guidelines on replacement cycles. Um, you know, are your PCs too slow, fail often? You know, PCs have gotten fast and don't age out for speed as quickly as in the past. Typical replacement is three to five years. Three to five years, nonprofit will stretch it to five, six years to get the life out of a laptop. But I, I will say about five years, if you're not setting a replacement cycle and kind of putting your computers on a rotation, five years, bad things start to happen. Hard drive fails, computer gets slow. So, you know, here we replace ours every three years, for-profit businesses is every three. If you can at least get to that four to five year cycle, that would be great. It also allows you when you're on that four year cycle, that computer is not necessarily bad. They make great spares for in case you bought a new computer, it has an issue, you can always pull up a spare and get one working. Um, also, are staff using their personal devices right now to work? That you know, that's a huge security risk. Computer access might be open to all family members. It's hard to protect against family downloading malware, viruses, or even the individual. Do they have the right protection on that voice uh, on that thing? And then, how much org data can be asset, at, you know accessed by family members or anywhere that that computer is? Um, I would suggest if you're going to continue to let staff use their personal computers to work. At, meta, at minimum, I would get some, some policies in place. I would make sure that updates are applied every day. That includes updates, web browsers, such as Firefox and Chrome. You know, if they're using Adobe Reader, Java, all those high security patches need to be installed. And then ensure that Windows Defender is at least enabled as an antivirus or consider purchasing them organization-owned laptops. I know some organizations struggle with this, being able to budget, but there are some really good deals out there for nonprofits. We'll get to another slide. TechSoup has partnerships with Dell, Lenovo, I think HP, uh, Jason can correct me if I'm wrong, but really TechSoup works to kind of get you those, those you know, nonprofit discounts. Um, my biggest advice is staying away from purchasing from Costco, Walmart, Best Buy, unless it's a business built computer. You do not want to be buying home computers. Um, also, when you purchase a consumer based product at one of these stores, you're getting a lot of bloatware. They're not built to be, you know, they're not built as strong as a business grade purchase. Uh, if you still have servers and network, uh, you know, if you still have a server, 
let's talk about moving to the cloud. Um, but if you need to have that server again, same life cycle every four to five years. Uh, if you have every physical location should have the right networking equipment. That is a network switch, a firewall. Um, the firewall is necessary to keep you secure against um, infiltrators. These have regular patches and maintenance that need to be done. Um, and you wanna, you know, based on firewalls, probably every four to five years, you wanna look at and replace that networking equipment. Printers, as they go every four to five years, and then phones and other equipment, we're gonna talk about just doing ongoing evaluation of those. So this is an actual picture, went out to visit nonprofit, and this was their server. I don't think anyone has logged in or went on this server in a while. It's a ton of dust. Um, so my biggest question was, obviously this infrastructure was old, you know, is it secure? Most likely this is a 10 year old server without the right operating, not getting patches and firewall. There was no maintenance on the machine. And then what you want, really wanna do is say, what is on that server and can we utilize cloud technologies? Um, so we're just gonna talk about that. Does anyone still have a server on-prem? I promise we won't judge. Yes, yes, replacing this year, no idea, <laughs> so yes. So what we wanna do is set a plan, right? This is the first time to assess, do we really need that server? And as we talk about a Synology NAS device is good too, but as we talk about how can we get you away from number one, having to replace hardware, and then how can you utilize what's available for nonprofits and do it securely in removing that server? Um, but you know, if you have that dated server sitting there, you are way more vulnerable because it's not getting the patch, the maintenance, and then what happens if that server goes? Do you have the right backup? So we'll continue to walk on. If you still have a server, um, you have some fun projects and stuff ahead of you, but once you get through those projects, your work is just gonna transform. Um, and we'll get more into that when we talk about utilizing cloud services. They really are built for productivity and collaboration versus just having a file store somewhere. Um, just for PC purchasing, some high level advice, standardize. If you're gonna use Dell, stick with Dell. If you're gonna use Lenovo, stick with Lenovo. Um, you're gonna wanna set up a budget and a recite, you know, make sure you have that in your budget to replace machines um, every four to five years, I'm, gonna, I'm talking to nonprofits every four to five years, um, but make sure you're budgeting for it. Um, and then I, when I share this document, there'll be a nonprofit discount purchasing through, I put a link to TechSoup, uh, Justin can also share their product page. And then some important advice, October 14th, 2025, if you have any 10 operating systems, Microsoft is no longer going to be supporting that 10 operating system. You're going to have to go to um, Windows 11. It's a great time to see if your current workstations can take that upgrade. It's basically just an update through Microsoft, but that you know, you're going to definitely want to make sure that your workstation can support that upgrade, but then if not, you're going to have to start planning to replace some workstations next year um, and get you know, make sure that they're secure and supported by Microsoft. A lot of times what we do is when we're onboarding new organizations or when we run into organizations, they did go to Best Buy, Costco, all of that to get their workstations. Or they saw that a home operating system was $100 cheaper and decided to purchase that system versus the pro operating system. You want to stay with the pro operating system, has less bloatware, more secure, and it's for organizations. TechSoup does have a operating system upgrade license. It's a one-time out if that has been your purchasing. Um, the cost is $16 through TechSoup, and I have a link in here, but it is a Windows Pro full operating system. Um, it, the cost is $16, and you're going to want to get that 
upgrade and upper, you know, upgrade any that might be home systems right now. And we love TechSoup for that because normally it would be $99 or $150 to buy that operating system. So thank you, TechSoup. Uh, biggest question I get is, I don't know what to buy in terms of PC build recommendations. I'll share this. I had our CTO kind of fill this out, but we kind of define our users in three buckets. There's your light user, maybe some internet, maybe updating something in a CRM, but really typical light user. You can pay, estimate to pay around $800 for a laptop. This is all laptop pricing. Um, and then standard user, probably around $1,000 for a quality machine with this build, and then power user. Um, I think it's, there are several times a year that are good purchasing. One of them is coming up. You, you want to hit on those Black Friday sales, all of that, and really you can get some substantial discounts based on the time of year that you're purchasing. So ongoing, these are all the fun. They're not high priority, but you know, you want to say, is your internet speed adequate? Are there better options available, lower cost? Um, are you still using the bandwidth? Is it slow? Is that frustrated? I used to put a little tickler on my calendar because this is not a fun project to go around doing internet shopping, but it's something that should be evaluated when contracts are coming up. Um, you can there are brokers out there that will also work with you to kind of do comparison shot and bring you the best speed bandwidth and options for your organization. Uh, another thing you want to look at is your phone system. Like how much is it costing you to keep your antiquated phone system? Like if you're still using, um, I think back in the days of Avaya, if I have that old equipment back in the back room, you know, is it meeting your current needs? Can it expand for future needs? Um, really looking at internet phone options. We have a ton of organizations going directly. I have a thing here, but they're moving towards internet op, you know, internet phone systems and getting rid of those manual systems. Again, most important thing is you have tech policies and procedures. Again, we talked about just do staff know where to go, what to say, what your policies and your procedures are? And then when's the last time you updated your security policies? Um, that is a whole different thing, but are you doing um, cybersecurity awareness and training with your staff? Do you know, does your staff know how to identify a phishing attempt? Uh, what is it? 91% of successful data breaches started with a phishing attack. That's the easiest place to start. Through TechSoup, you can get know before cybersecurity awareness and training. Uh, and then we do that in partnership with TechSoup. So if you want to get some regular cybersecurity awareness training for your staff, allowing us to send them phishing and seeing who might need a little bit more education or homework and identifying those attacks, definitely check out that resource on TechSoup. Um, are you using a password vault to maintain and lock down access to various accounts? Password managers are really great. Um, so what you're going to want to do is get an enterprise level password manager. Justin and Aretha can correct me as wrong, but I think there is a discount through TechSoup for Dashlane um, for a password manager. Uh, and really what you want to look at is that password manager. Obviously, it's making access to your systems more secure, but it's also going to help aid you in onboarding and offboarding individuals. We all have access to a lot of systems and a lot of stuff. So what you could do is implement a password manager. You can administrate, administer that password manager, and within one click, you can block access to all the systems that they had access to. Um, internet phone options, when we see an individual that is using Microsoft Office 365, obviously Microsoft Teams Voice is a really solid solution for them. Uh, we have a lot of organizations that are Google or using Zoom a lot, Zoom Voice. Um, we've heard a lot from nonprofits that it's very helpful. There's the Google Voice option. Mixed reviews, I'll say on that. Um, and but then there's also other internet phone options like Ring Central and Eight by Eight. 
Um, but if you're, you know, we'll talk about productivity and collaboration. If you're in Microsoft, it really does make sense to just keep it all in one unified system. If your Google's Zoom and your most organizations are using Zoom for their board meetings, et cetera, Zoom is a, Zoom is a very solid option. Uh, we do have, I said about creating IT policies, we do have a policy workbook. Um, also, I'm not going to lie, if you go to Copilot and you say, give me sample IT policies and procedures, AI does a really good job of building them, and then you can just modify them for your organization. But you didn't hear from me, and it's not recorded. We took that part out. <laughs> um, so you want to take a step back and you want to rate your infrastructure. I will be sending some um, Excel documents, link to Excel documents with all this. So you're going to want to rate your infrastructure. Not purely scientific. I put together a quick list of things that I would want to do. Um, so you want to do, do we have clear oversight for IT? Is it effective? Does it need work? And it's a priority. Uh, workstations are under five years old, PC support is timely and effective. So you just want to kind of go through and rate your infrastructure um, and then kind of have some of the priority and the needs work items that you and the tech committee can work on. That was a lot. I need a sip of water. So if you want to type a question for me, I would love to take some time to respond. So see, someone already looked into the Windows 10 retirement. That's really great. And Jill had a great question. Let me go up and see what Jill's question is. So requirements for when your staff is fully remote. We did, it's hard, right? I couldn't imagine supporting a hybrid staff environment now. Like back in the day when I supported staff, they were all at their desks and they just screamed from their office for help. And I had to, to go in and aid them. Um, supporting a hybrid environment or being able to remote onto someone's PC to provide assistance is the first thing. So you're gonna wanna look for a device management tool such as Spiceworks or something else to manage the devices. Um, there are some options and we did a webinar with TechSoup on what device management options there were. So maybe Justin can find that webinar and put it in here, but there was really a lot of great advice on securing a hybrid remote workforce. And then, you know, looking maybe for outside tech support um, if you're not already using it. And yes, we will share the presentation. I will give you the full deck and a link to the Excel documents. <laughs> um, how do you say that, Alesta? Very pretty name. That's the biggest challenge is getting staff on board for change. It's all about change management. Um, I would say, I failed because I knew the most about technology and I just wanted to force the change because I knew better because I knew technology. So really having that tech committee and getting the right people around that tech committee to help you facilitate the change. Definitely, you need some support um, to make those and whether you're getting it from an outside consultant, whether you're getting it from people within the organization or you're getting it from the board, but demonstrating the value of making those technology changes, whether it's gonna come from cost savings and inc increased efficiencies. I know the one thing I struggled with was just getting people to use our data in strategic systems. Um, I don't know, but people just didn't wanna enter data. So really getting leadership to kind of help you move the needle on those things. Now, if it's leadership, you're just gonna have to go in with the return on investment and why you think these changes are important. So now we're gonna talk about product. Keep the email, the questions coming, happy to answer them all. But right now we're, we're gonna dive into productivity and collaboration. So this was the second tier on the diagram I showed you earlier. So you're gonna wanna ask yourself, the staff have the software they need to get their job done? Is it up to date? Are they able to work remotely? 
How is your team collaborating, especially in today's environment? And have you considered moving to a unified or integrated cloud system? Are you already using one? Um, so again, it's gonna be ideal if your email, calendar, file share are all on a unified system. Office 365 and Google Suite um, probably are the top two options. So if you could all just wake up, uh, <laughs> we've been going now about 35 minutes, but just tell me, I always like to see how many are in Microsoft and how many in Google. We already know there's quite a few on servers, but um, I always like to do the, the thing or are using both. Microsoft, Microsoft, that one, Google, both, Google, Google, Dropbox, both, both, okay. Wow, a lot of both. So as we move forward in this, this productivity and collaboration, we're going to want to talk about why both and why it's important to pick one and stay in a lane. Um, so... Most confusing thing too is licensing. It's, you know, TechSoup has some really in-depth information on licensing, but I'm gonna tell it to you the easiest way I know how to explain it to you and how I talk to nonprofit organizations. So with Microsoft, you have the nonprofit business, business basic. That's basically access to the web apps and email. And you get up to, if you're an organization over 300, we'll talk differently, but I'm assuming most of you are staff under 300. You're gonna to wanna to go with the business basic license for just email only and web access. The business standard license is $3 per user per month. That's basically what you get in the basic thing, but you're also gonna get the Microsoft Office application downloads, the Word, the Excel, the PowerPoint. And so you have the desktop applications versus just having the web apps. We recommend that every nonprofit be on the Microsoft 365 Business Premium. The first 10 of those are free for nonprofits if, you're, if you meet the eligibility requirements and then $5.50 per user per month. That you're gonna get everything you get in the standard with the web applications. You also get like publisher and some other, but those include, that license includes security options, um, tools that we use for all of our managed service customers. First of all, it's called now Entra ID, but Azure, you get those Azure rights is the former name, but Entra. So basically when you have a user or a workstation, we can join that to your Microsoft 365 tenant and say, this is this device, this user belongs to this organization. So they're just kind of not free floating. It also includes what we call P1 Defender rights. So there is, um, we configure Defender for Office. So what we do is we cut down on your phishing attempts. We do safe attachment scanning link attachment scanning, just cutting down on your risk in terms of security. Um, it can allow us to configure Intune for device management. So we talked a little bit about device management. Intune is one component where you can put patches and software updates through where if someone loses a device, we can remotely wipe it. So a lot of benefits in that $5.50 nonprofit licensing. Then when you look on Google, we always get the thing. Google, a lot of organizations are on the Google for nonprofits. Um, they're not paying much. Google has done a good job of giving you a little bit more storage now in, in recent stuff. Um, but if you look at a comparable licensing, first of all, Google's all gonna be web apps. They don't have any desktop apps. But if you really wanna start doing device management and, um, really securing your environment, you're going to have to move to what is called the Business Plus model, which is $5.04 per user per month. And so that's comparable to the Microsoft's $5.50 pretty much. But there is one caveat with Google versus Microsoft. Microsoft, you can mix and match licensing. Google, even if you have volunteers, if you have people that just want it for email, every user has to have the same licensing. 
So if you are in Google and you decide you want to get a little bit higher up in your security options, your uh, everybody in your Google tenant is going to have to move to that five dollar and four cents per month user license. I'm happy to dive into that any more in the future, but those are the key points I want to take away for Google versus Microsoft licensing. There are also other file options. We've seen some using Box, Dropbox, Ignite is another one we see. So we're like, if it's not unified, integrated. But both Microsoft and Google have really good email file storage solutions. And you're gonna have it added expenses if you're gonna use a Dropbox or a Box or an Ignite. So really what we'd like you to do is kind of move everything under one unified environment and use the file sharing and those options underneath there to save yourself on licensing costs. If you're already paying for it, why pay for it somewhere else? Um, and then my advice overall is as you want to increase your security footprint, which we all should be focused on now. If you are in both environments, you have to work worry about securing and getting both environments secure. So if you use a unified system, then you're only using looking at one system to secure and train your staff on. So if you're using both, it's really time to take a step back and say, why are we using both? A lot of times we see it's, it's culture um, or it's just there wasn't any planning behind it. We just started using what we could. Um, so again, we want you to rate your productivity and collaboration. We'll give you this worksheet, but basically if you're using a unified system, is it effective, need work priority? Are you able to do all these functions in your productivity and collaboration? And then again, bring it back to the committee for some future planning. Again, security overall, our policies enforced to use these systems. Some higher level organizations have a lot to, to do with compliances. Are you meeting the compliances? There's a lot you can do within these unified systems like say data loss prevention policies. You wanna make sure no social security or date of birth or anything proprietary gets out of your organization, you can set up specific policies to block that information from getting out of your system. You wanna use encrypted email. You wanna use multi-factor authentication or what Google calls two-step verification. It is mandatory. I don't care if everybody hates doing it. It's no longer an option not to have some type of authentication set up. It has gotten so bad that Microsoft is just going and turning it on for all organizations. So before you're caught off guard, if you're not using multi-factor authentication in Microsoft, one day Microsoft is gonna turn it on for your organizations and no one's gonna be able to access anything. So you need to look at enabling MFA. Uh, single sign-on, that's when you can put application access behind say Microsoft credentials. So you have a Salesforce or some HR system, you can configure that to be single sign-on so that you can use your Microsoft credentials to log into all of those applications. You can also look at password vault and managers. Biggest one I see too is admin access. If you are an admin on any of these systems and it's an email tied to it, you better create a separate admin access. So if you're a global admin on your 365 tenant, you fall victim to a phishing attempt, you have now given that individual access to do whatever they want as a global admin. So you wanna make sure that whatever access you have does not have email tied to it regularly. So you wanna have a separate login for that. You wanna ensure that you're doing backup, make sure those servers are backed up. And if you're using a cloud solution, you wanna do something such as um, spanning or cloud backup of those environments. And then consider a compliance plan if you do have some high security stuff. Um, so we already learned that a lot of you are kind of using both systems, et cetera. I have quite a few slides to get through, but I definitely will um, 
you know, get to some questions and answers before the end of this. I'll also make myself available or try to get uh, to all of them in chat if, if you have additional questions. Um, and the last top tier of this is the stuff that holds your clients, your donors, your event attendees, your volunteers, your members, your finances. Although they're small and at the top of this list, these are probably the most important things that you work with every day and probably what causes you the most frustration on a daily basis. Um, you know, if these were clean, they'd all be in these nice little buckets. Here's marketing, here's, you know, organizational management, constituent management, and then everything would talk and integrate and you would get clear pictures on who are our donors, who attended events, who's a volunteer, and then tied into your marketing, like how much have they engaged with our emails? And, and if they give a donation, right, you're, you're tied, your donor management system's tied to finance, invoices go out, et cetera, et cetera. That's the ideal state. Um, I think really what we want to do is evaluate these. And good news is there's so many more tools out there that have custom built APIs in them now that let lets you connect various sources of data. So you might think, oh, we might have to overhaul all these systems, but really there is a lot to do with integrations now, much more than there was 10, 15 years ago. It was like all in one systems. And it was like, oh, you only need one system that does it all. I think with these integrations and all these uh, advances in technology, you really do have a lot more options today. So again, you're gonna wanna evaluate your systems <laughs> take function, you know, take inventory of functional areas and what systems that support them. What systems are you capturing your program and service delivery? Uh, can you analyze your data and the staff able to pull the reports that they need? Do you want something more advanced like Power BI and dashboards and live dashboards? Only once you get your infrastructure right, your productivity and collaboration right, and your data systems right, can you really start to advance your mission and, and ease everyday work, like workflow automations, you know, live dashboarding. So hopefully we'd like to see organizations evolve to that level. Um, you know, a good idea is lock everyone in a room and kind of define your processes. Uh, Draw IO is a good tool for, uh, to help with this, like kind of mapping out, but I will tell you good old post-it notes, everyone in the room and just mapping out your processes um, would be a great exercise to do. You learn a lot of the nuances of the systems. I'm gonna give you a, another Excel sheet. Again, every organization is unique, um, but the most important thing is to identify what is working well and what needs some work. This is where having more team input is valuable. You will probably need to bring more program staff into the discussion and document their processes and systems they use. And then if you remember the earlier slide where we discussed tactical versus strategic, this is where strategy really does come into play. Uh, you will only wanna ha have important outcomes and processes that will happen if folks use the system. So again, so you wanna list out your systems, what is it tracking, what does it need to do, then sc score how well it is working, are we able to get the reports that we need, would key integrations be useful, and then rate the effectiveness from zero, which is not working to 10, and then which is meeting your needs, is 10 meeting your needs. So then the lower scores definitely mean that these items are a priority and put those at the top of your priority list. Um, some things that organizations struggle with a lot is case management systems. So we have a guide to case management systems and then a guide to low cost fundraising systems, AKA donor management systems. This is our highest used resource and really breaks down what donor management systems are out there and what key functionality cost, et cetera. So definitely take a look at the, this, this resource. And then it's the action plan. We have 10 minutes to discuss an action plan. <laughs> um, so it took me four years to get all of our small staff to use OneDrive SharePoint. Good for you though, I'm making that, that progress, right? Anybody responsible for tech, 
you know how hard it is to have users adopt it. Um, for larger organizations, could you only imagine if you had 200 staff and you were trying to get them all to use the same system? That's why you can use, so say, staff was in Google, you have everybody that prefers Google, but the organization is securing Microsoft, they will disable using Intune and setting up policies that doesn't even let Google open up on the staff computer. Um, so maybe what you can't force by having policies and procedures, you can force it by fully utilizing technologies. Um, so again, you wanna create your master list of projects. You wanna create you know, what are your priority items from infrastructure, productivity and collaboration, and then systems and create your priority list. And then it's like, where do you start? So if you're underwater, obviously you're gonna wanna tackle something from either the infrastructure replacing workstations or something where staff isn't able to do their day-to-day -day tasks like email, file sharing, collaboration. Um, so. For, fix first what is underwater and then start to move progress and that and all the other systems. And then just remember, you can't do everything at once. I remember, oh, the big, you go to a conference and you learn about all these technologies and I get these big gear eyes and this excitement and I go back to the office and I wanted to tackle everything and I couldn't tackle, I, I just couldn't, right? So what you wanna do is prioritize, pick the one thing that you're gonna do and move forward with that. Again, prioritize at the base up towards strategic systems. This is also another worksheet to help you with benefit versus cost. I don't think there's a nonprofit out there that I have not spoken to where they're like, we're a nonprofit, we don't have the budget. I'm like, all we do is serve nonprofits. So that's what we hear day in and day out. <laughs> um, but what, us nonprofits are good at negotiating to get those nonprofit discounts. We're so used to saying it, but we're a nonprofit. Um, so what you'll want to do is you'll want to score your projects. Uh, pick rough guess for scores, not a science. So, you know, for example, if you want to get a better picture of event participation in your main system, Today you look in two different systems. So ask yourself, how much will it increase effectiveness? How much will it reduce time? Is it straightforward to implement? Is it expensive? And can you do it in-house? Then you're gonna to wanna to total the scores, repeat the process for you know, replacing hardware and then total the scores. And then I would say higher scores go to the top of the list because they're easy. They'll make the most increase in effectiveness and they're the easiest to implement and most cost effective. And then, you know, you're gonna to wanna to take on projects, but no, it's just not you that's gonna be affected by it. So really making a list and being reasonable about what the project is, who the owner is, who it impacts, the timeline and all of that. This is maybe where you might wanna get some outside consult from a consultant who has experience with this or talk to other nonprofits who've been with this to try to create your list of projects and your initial budget. Again, you just wanna keep communication open. open. Whatever project you are working on, make sure to publicize your project plan including risk, timeline, and expected pain points to staff, help get staff ready to accept and adapt change, hold teams accountable, but stress the benefits so staff will push through the main pain points, and maybe define some measures and how ongoing process will help you track how well things are working over time. I know it's rough. I mean, but I think communication is key to this. Budgeting. Um, this is always fun because people ask me, where can I get money for whatever the projects are that I <laughs> recommended? So I, if I had the answer, I, I would tell every nonprofit where they can get stuff funded. Um, so maybe, you know, in your budget, get creative, scoring tech costs, the program areas, look at when maybe, you know, budgeting, when cash flow is at the highest. Uh, to do more some of the expensive projects. Um, being able to communicate, um, I'll give you a, a budget down, download, but also be able to communicate the return on investment. Can you write the, 
the project and maybe another grant or another program area that um, you get funding for and tie it more to a program versus a overall technology upgrade. Um, you know, we nonprofits, we know how to get, get there, but I think we have a budgeting spreadsheet available. So it kind of details most of the, the item, the hardware, the software, the service, and also staffing. If you're going to have to bring in staffing or use an outside consultant, it can help you kind of create your initial budget. Uh, one thing I would say is engage your board. You never know if they work for a business or um, something that can help aid you in the technology upgrades. A lot of local businesses have pro bono volunteers that want to give back to the nonprofit community. Uh, my only advice, if you're going to use a volunteer, make sure you can stick with it through the project and that each party understands the scope and deliverable of the project. Uh, and then if say they're going to build something custom for you, just know how you'll get longer term support. Um, also, we can help provide some guidance um, if you want. Funding, donors might fund part or all. I know I had to build a new data system once and a funder is like, if you can match the other half, we'll give you half, which made it a fun race to try to see how many other donors I could get to get the other half of the project. Um, and then, you know, we get creative. Some projects aren't as expensive as you think they are also to adopt. So here is another thing, you know, if you're gonna ask for funding, be prepared. This little worksheet will help you. Who do you need to convince? Is it internal? Is it outside for funding? But this is a great worksheet, worksheet for making the case. Um, and then a little bit of return on investment. There's a link for some, to make some technology decisions. There are some tech assessment tools to kind of help you rate where you are. Um, our tool, I should have put TechSoup first, but ours is more of an expert guided, uh, cost is 450 for this assessment. TechSoup has a really cool digital assessment tool for nonprofits. Again, it's free self -guide, guided and there's a link to it. And then N10, if you're not familiar with N10, their Tech Accelerate, they have a free self-guided tech assessment that might help you in some of this technology planning and budgeting. Uh, so in summary, assess, think of what we have now, where do we wanna go? Tech committee is critical. Create your action plan. Do we have the resources to accomplish what we need to do? Don't try to take everything on at once. Involve stakeholders, get buy-in. I know easier said than done. Budget. Do we need some expert advice or assistance? And then ensure you continue to assess security and training throughout. All right, look at that. I did it with two minutes to spare. So we have two minutes, maybe a minute, minute and a half. Any resources on a cloud migration project action plan checklist that you can recommend? In all honesty, we do this over the phone every day with nonprofits and having them understand the migration. And we can even provide estimated costs, but it will help you get the roadmap to then either get our proposals, take it out to other organizations and shop it around. So if you fill out this managed IT support for nonprofits on TechSoup, or you can email me directly at melanie.kickimpact.org, we can connect with you and help you map out, get a quick summary of where you're at and then talk you through what action steps you should be doing for the future in terms of any cloud migrations. Um, something that you would wanna highlight, um, again, I'll put my email in there. Um, if I cannot connect with you, I will definitely connect you with someone who can help you through for the journey, maybe discuss one on one where what you know where it is that you are and where you want to be. But I hope today's information was helpful to you. Um, and Aretha will get all the slides and all the worksheets out to you. And happy tech planning. Um, I hope you all get the support, budget, and all that you need to make all the technology upgrades at your organization. Thank you so much, Melanie. Justin, I wanted to make sure that you were able to get those questions in the q and I see you were typing an answer to one. 
And Stephen said, do you have a do you have resources on compliance like GRC, GLBA? I don't know if you answered that, Melanie. There's a lot to compliance, right? We will never say we can work towards compliance and work with IT professionals to help them meet that compliance. But those compliances are supported by technology. But I would say if you have specific questions, because compliance is a big, big item, um, feel happy to email me and we can set up some time to chat to say where you are, what compliances you have and where you can get to, to meet those compliances. Perfect. Thank you so much. Have a great day, everybody. Stay safe. Bye-bye. All right. Thank you.